Hey there guys, I want to get a uh, little started with a little demo uh, tutorial video here talking about Module Tool. Again, this is for 3D animation. And if you go to the Module Tool, of course, it gives you a little graphic here of this heavy versus light. And what this is, is this is an exercise in utilizing some animation. It's basically an animated rigged uh, ball. One being a heavy ball and one represented and animated as a light ball. Now I've included some examples from students past here that you're welcome to go and take a look at. You can see here some examples of students past that have done heavy and light ball animations. And you can see some simple examples. That's obviously a light ball. All right, now getting to these though, you'll find I've provided some resources for you all right down here in the assignment two, heavy versus light bouncing ball. And the two resources are called course, this one called the Ultimate Ball. Um, and there's some other tutorials here as well. Here, of course, is the module for the assignment. This is where you would turn it in. And then, of course, you could also turn it in here through the module of the discussion of heavy versus light. Now, before we even get started in downloading and setting project and getting this ball and building a simple set, uh, something to take into account. Now, I just found this online, and this is just the basics bouncing ball action. And what you're going to find here is this is obviously like a rubber ball or a lightweight bouncing ball because it's got squash and stretch. And it's got obviously a light ball, what's called arc of motion, where you've got your hits whenever it hits the ground. And of course, ball at highest point, ball at lowest point. And the fact that when it's traveling through the air, of course, it is not deformed. But when it squashes or it takes off, it might deform with some stretch. And that Following the ease in, ease outs like we did with the first module of animating the just simple rolling and stopping ball, that when things are moving slowly, there are more frames. There's more, it's, it's moving slow, so you see more of it. When things are moving quickly, such as in the downs or the ups, it's, and that's basically using that animated curve principle of ease in, ease out. Of course, we need to be careful of the ease in, ease out here where, because we have to have it be a flat tangent so that when it hits the ground, it doesn't do a, it, it actually stops its movement. So this is just an example here of just a common graph. All right, so let's jump over here now. And this is your typical interface when you load your Maya, of course. And we typically just go OK. But remember to move our timeline to the max. Remember, we might actually have to expand or shorten the number of keyframes we have here. I'm going to go over to the far right corner here, which has got my little running man. And this is my preferences for the time slider at 24 frames per second. And I want to do 24 frames per second times one, meaning it will play back real time. If you use some of these others, it'll play too fast or it'll play at a non real time if we do it at every frame. So 24 frames per second times one. Hit that save. Recall now, whenever we get started inside of Maya, now again, just let you know, I do have my outliner open here just for the sake of happening, but we could always get that removed. But before we ever start with any project, remember we went to File, Project Window, Choose New, and again, this will be Heavy Light, or you could give me give it, uh, I'll call it maybe Bouncing Ball Project, and we give it a location. And this is where we need to make sure that it's going to a location. So here's 230T, uh, module two heavy for slight. So I'll put it into its own project folder. And you see, because I chose new, it's going to create a scene file, image file, source file, all this stuff, all this data will have its own file folders created, which is what allows us to work inside Maya and everything knows where to go. So if we do a play blast, it automatically will go to the movie window. If we make renders, it'll go to the images folder. If we need textures, that's in the source images folder. So we just hit accept. Now, because we did that, okay, I need to come here and I need to go and download the ultimate ball. Okay? So I'm just going to download and when it asks me, of course, it's going to go to my download folder. So let's go ahead and go back. Okay. And here is my ultimate ball here over in my download folder and I'm going to go over and find now I guess I have to do it this way let's do summer 2021 232 
heavy versus light. There's my Maya project folder. And I'm gonna place this in, I could place it in assets or I could just place it in scenes. Okay, whoops, didn't mean to do that. Let's get rid of what I don't want. All right, so now it's in my scene file. Let me just drag it into my scene so I can get rid of my that download. Folder. All right, so here it is in my scene file and it's called Ultimate Ball version 1.01. Now, to start this though, let's start by building a simple set. Now, it might help right now to import in that ultimate ball, so we have some element here of scale to build our scene, and you see what this ultimate ball basically is, right? And you see it is a ball. Now, again, we could always change the colors by being able to go into some of the parameters, right, when we go into this. If you want to know what this ball is really made up of, you can see in my outliner here, I can open it up and see what is making it tick. So you see I've got different controllers. There's the mesh group itself. So I can even go into here and mess around if I want to do a different color. You know, and I've got elements of color that I can apply to this ultimate ball that are basically going to be built in. Let's see if I can actually find where it's got my color. here somewhere. Actually, it'd probably end up being here in the shader node. Yep, and there's the different colors. So again, if I want to have two of these, I would just want to select that. In fact, let's take, if I want to do that right now, right, I've got the entire group selected because I've got the top of the stack, and I can hit Control D to get a second one. I'm going to use the main controller here to move that second one over. And all I need to do now to give this a different color, like for example, if I wanted to have a different colored ball, let's go until we get the mesh. And I can right click and say, yes, let's add this material to that. And now we get a blue ball to represent maybe perhaps the heavy ball, the light ball kind of thing. try this again. Make sure I got the entire group here. Of course, I could always, maybe instead of fighting and arguing with all this duplication and everything, let's just do it this way. Keep it simple and stupid, right? Let's go ahead and import one ball. And you see how I basically have, I moved that ball is with this lower controller and let's go ahead and import a second one and so I've got two balls right and now I could go in here if I want to I could even call this something like heavy ball and go ahead call this one light ball. All right. And so I can now distinguish the two of these specifically here by selecting the movement controller. See, heavy ball, light ball. And if I really want to do that, now I can open this up, find the mesh. See, there's a mesh group here and give that now the color or variation of color. Make it All right, so heavy ball, light ball. Heavy is blue, light is going to be yellow. Now, let's zoom in for a second here on these to show you these kind of symbolism of what's going on with this rig. Well, you see if I select these different what are called controllers. Let's hide my grid a second. You can see these controllers are 
can, this one, for example, will control the translate X, Y, and Z, and you see how that can create elements of squash and stretch. So we can key that to get that squash and stretch. What about this center one here? This one gives me movement vertical and, you know, vertical or horizontal, right? Forward and back. But it also gives me, if I switch to rotate, the ability of rotation. But just remember that the squash and stretch is on the Y axis, okay? And I can also do that with this one here. You see, it only allows me to do translate. So this rig, as it basically stands, allows us to do squash and stretch and movement based upon the center controller, but also on the bottom controller. See that? And this also, of course, gives me the ability of doing rotations and movements that way. So let's just zoom out a second. Let me go ahead and get my general rig back down. Because what we need to do here now is build a stage. And this might be a good opportunity to kind of say, you know what, I'm going to have oops, this guy facing 90 that way. Let's go ahead and move him to the right. Let's have my light ball moved over here. And in case we don't know what I'm doing here, let's do an exact negative. So they're kind of facing with that little triangular controller. Now, if you don't know, I'm switching through my tools here. Now, basically, the tools basically are like this, right? I have a selection tool, which is uh, Q, W, which is move. That's my shortcut key, see, Q. If I hover over, it'll tell me my W is my shortcut key for move. Rotate is E, see, and scale is R. And I think I showed you guys last week even where if you want to add lights and cameras and so on, there's actually another tool there called the T tool. And that's the toggle that lets you toggle through a lot of these settings in a visual manipulative tool. All right, so I've got my balls light and heavy here kind of facing each other. Now let's build the simple set. So to build the simple set, let's just create a plane. So, and let's go ahead and create some platforms. So I'm just going to create a platform. Again, you don't have to build it exactly like this. You can build it however you want. Let's go ahead and move this out to the edge. And control D to move this one over to this side. Now, you'll notice that they are now, let's move them actually up a little bit to get a little bit more of a leap, more of a jump, right? Because the, these are kind of going to jump in congruence, heavy ball, light ball, and so on. But to get them where I want them to be here, okay, you can see I can move this up to its initial position, but it's actually easier to use the center rings. You can see I can actually do this at the same time. If it lets me, there we go. And you see I, so the main aero base controller is mostly only used for the movements forward and back. So they're kind of poking out there. And this is actually, you see, notice what keeps happening here where I accidentally keep selecting my set. Watch what I can do here. Layer, create an empty layer. So this is just like Photoshop, right? Or Illustrator. And I could call this my set, hit save. And then I can select shift my set, right click and add selected objects. And by doing that now, I can actually freeze them by making this value here be R for reference. And you now I won't accidentally select them. So all I have here is this control. And this is essentially called the master controller, and it's used to move these things forward and back. Kind of like the way we moved our ball um, in the, the first assignments. But to move vertically or to rotate, I'm going to use the middle one. And whenever I need to, of course, squash or stretch, I'm going to use the top or the bottom. So let's go ahead now. 
move this guy to its initial. Now again, if you ever get a problem where you're like, oh, I can't, I can't get in there and get to that controller anymore, just switch to wireframe and it'll let you do that, see? So let's go ahead and select this one. Move it back. So I have my side view here, and I'm ready now to start creating the illusion of a heavy ball and a light ball. Best way to probably do that though, guys, let's go ahead and hit save, right? And I can call this light, heavy, ball. And I like to use the values of A, B, C instead of numbers. And that's because when it comes to actually rendering, the last thing you want to do is render something with a number at the end of it, because you'll actually get like, if it was heavy ball one, it would actually render heavy ball one, one, heavy ball one, two, and your numbers get all screwy up there. Let's just do that. So let's go ahead and hit my space bar. And I'm gonna get to the front view here. And the first thing I wanna do, let's start with the obvious, which I think would probably be the light ball. I think the light ball would be the easiest to animate here. Okay, and you see, I currently have a translate value of 7.27, that was in the Y. And what I can do there is I'm just gonna key translate y at a, at a number here. Again, try not to start exactly at zero. I'll move it to 10. And I'm just gonna right click and key it. Okay. And I'm gonna come to the center one here, right click and key it. And what that does now, that allows us to activate our auto key function. And now it's just a matter of, okay, well, a light ball will bounce more and will travel more than, say, a heavy ball, like a bowling ball, right? So I need to start to think, this is why it's very similar to our last exercise, is I'm going to think here at 10, how long is it going to take to kind of create our little bounce. And this is actually a good time to kind of use a little bit of a cheat. Watch what I'm going to do. Create, curve tools, CV curve, okay? And I'm just going to go double click to represent two clicks. Double click to relieve two. One, two, click. Oops, I created a third. And enter. And you see what that does is it gives me a little cheat sheet to see what the path of this ball needs to do time. Obviously, it's traveling all the way across the screen. Now, I am realizing at one point I may need to offset these guys just a little bit or else they're going to collide with each other. Okay. With that done, now let's think about what the heavy ball would do. Well, for one thing, it's not going to jump at the beginning. It would probably just go like this, right? Because it's heavy. And then it would one, two, three. One, two, three clicks. One, two, three. And then come to a stop. And so you see it's a much different pattern of movement. So now we can come here now. I'm going to take those two curves that I just created, right? And I'm going to right click and put them, add selected objects to our set so they don't get accidentally touched or moved. Now that I've done that, let's go ahead back to, okay, see, I can actually just draw a box here and that's gonna create my light ball controller. And I'm just gonna come here and just put keyframes right here on the X, Y, and Z, key selected at 10. And then in time, let's try, try, 70. How about that? 
70 frames. And what I'm gonna do with that at 70 is I'm just gonna move it to where it needs to stop moving. Just like that. Okay, so if, and because my auto key is on, Nope, you see nothing actually happened to it there. That's curious. Let's see here. I'm wondering if it doesn't want us to use our master controllers. It doesn't seem like it really likes that, does it? All right, well, if that's the case, then we'll just use the center controller here, right? So, like I said, at frame, oh, let's switch it to frame 80. I know that this needs to be here, just like our rolling ball, right? Now, the heavier ball is going to move a lot slower. So I may take this and have it be here. And I just realized one of the mistakes I made on this ball here is I never keyframed back. Okay. start there at that button. See, I never keyframed my what area direction is that X. It's just key. Along. Why not? Key. Now where did it go? See, it dropped underneath there. And this is kind of a good timing to kind of see, you notice how it's following that exact method. Now, remember what I said though, it takes a long time or slower or more frames when the ball is not moving fast. So if I were to scrub through now and start to think of myself, okay, well, I've got from, I've got 70, yeah, I went to frame 80. So starting at frame 10, so maybe I'll go to frame 18 to get to this location. And then I gotta figure, all right, well, if that's the case, I'm going through the air and I'm bouncing, we'll say at about 35. So if that bounce went from 18 to 35, then the next bounce will take less time. So we could kind of start to figure out, right? 35 minus 18 equals 17. So maybe we'll go with 14 frames. So 35 plus 14 equals 49. So let's go to 49. And look at that. It almost knows exactly where to be at 49. Okay, so now we've got 35 minus 14, let's say 49 plus 10, gets me to frame 59, okay, and we're almost already there, and then 59 plus 6 is 65. Oops, didn't mean to move it there. I meant to be at frame 65. And now that's going to be at that position. So you see now, we're starting to get where it wants to be and at what time. Now we can start to do what's called twinning or tweening. So this now needs to be in this position. Bend down. Let's twin or tween between this arc of motion, which would be here. Let's twin these two right about here. Where that should be. Let's twin right about here. About where that should be. Didn't take a key there. Let's try that. Okay, so we're getting the illusion of bounce and that position and 
race slowly comes to a stop. Now, because we learned last week that in the Windows animation menu set under graph editor, you're gonna see the motion of this ball performing properly according to that arc of bounce. And you see that we got a little bounce, okay? But go ahead and zoom in on this, okay? But now we need to do is we need to go in here and we need to start affecting the proper curves, right? Because we want this to be easing, you know, taken off and bounding without any kind of pause. Well, I guess we could give it a little bit of pause, just a little bit of a bounce there. But what we want is we want to do what's called a hold beat here, okay? Because when it hits the ground, we want to kind of have it just hold a moment. And we've got some other types of keys that we can adjust here, but pretty much the best way to do this, guys, let me just minimize this, is whenever it's on a down. Okay, so again, that's a down. That's a down. Watch what I can do. I'm going to just take this key, copy it, move one frame forward and paste it. And let's look and see what that that curve editor actually looks like now. And you see, you see what it is now, is that now it's coming in and stopping for a second before it takes back off. Now, I could also come in here though. I'm going to put a line between here and tell that to be a flat tangent. And you see now it comes in because it doesn't really slow down when it hits the ground, does it? So these need to be a flat tangent because it's going to go jump, hit the ground, wait a frame, and then take back off again. So let's go ahead and find another down point. Right there. You know what? I kind of like this maybe more over just a wee bit. Here's a key here, right? I'm gonna right click copy that key. This time I'm actually gonna go back a frame and paste just because I'm trying to even out this motion. Let's go back to our graph editor. Okay, here it is right here. Put a box between these two and tell that to be a flat tangent. Another one, it's another down. Let's copy that key, paste it, go back to our graph editor. Now it's these two that need to be a flat tangent. Scrub along here, find the next down right there, copy that key, go back a frame, paste it. Right here, let's tell that to be a flat tangent. And I really don't have to double up these here because from here forward, it kind of comes to a stop. So let's see this real time. Let's hit play. Okay. And again, right now, this is just a basic movement of it all. Now, I am a little disappointed at just how smooth these tops are. It looks like it's kind of stopping or pausing there, right here. So something we might want to do to kind of exaggerate this a bit is come over here and we can kind of, you know, give it a little bit more up hang time. Okay. Just like that. that looks so now we've got the basics of the bounce what if we were to introduce a rotation okay and we can go back to our center marker our center controller right this main controller we've already keyed and 
you can see we've got rotate X, Y, and Z. If I play with this value here, you see it's gonna give me a rotate X. So that is what we're gonna to use to keyframe some of the rotations. So let's key. The funny part of this is, is that may take 180 degrees to key. And from here to the next one, that might be a full 720. So again, this is where it's, we got, that's why we learned geometry. 720 times 360 equals, whoops, 720 plus 360. Or did I say nine, 180? Sorry, 180. It's 900. Okay? So this one will be 900 rotations. Let's double check it. Oh, now already we're starting to realize one error. And that is this needs to be negative 180. See? Because it's rotating a different direction, which means this one will be negative 900. We want it to roll in the direction it's bouncing. And since that was 720 to here, it's going to be negative 900 plus 360. Is that it? Negative 1260. Okay, and that will auto key. Whoop. And then negative 1260 to the next mark here, which will be 180, 1440, negative, 1440. Which means getting to this one is just gonna be negative 1440 plus 90, 1530. Negative 1530. The reason why I'm using full numbers here, guys, is because of, oh, and then negative 1530, and then coming to the very end, let's just add a 45, maybe. So let's see. Plus, I'll do, do another whole mother night. There, 1620. So this one now at the end is negative 1620. Let's see what this looks like. There, see? Nice, lightweight, bouncing ball. Math adds up. And that just means because it's traveling twice as far, it's rotating twice as much. Okay. Now, all we have to do now is focus on the squash and the stretch factors. So, this is me. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hit F to frame in on this. Maybe hit four so I can select both these because I'm going to want both these keyed at zero values first and then I'll go back and choose which one actually needs to be squashed and stretched because these little jumps may not squash it but a little bit. Okay, so this is where it might be helpful even to have a little bit of uh, uh, just change this back down to 100. Okay. This is where you may want to write down things like 10, you know, 18, to know when those need to be done. So let's just go here, select these guys. go and we're pretty much we could go ahead and keyframe all of these factors but you got to understand we're probably only going to be moving this in the y direction so probably get away with just keying the y for both of these looks like it wants me to do them individually anyways key and key and that simply is now the stretch factor so I can almost start to look here and say, okay, maybe move a frame. Just give this a little bit of stretch, just a little. Back here, put 
it back to zero. Zero and zero. Keep rolling now because when it goes here, we want to come in, key it, no squash, go one frame forward. So we get a little bit of stretch. Again, right about here, let's go to zero. There's no deformation when it's traveling, right? You don't need to have any deformation when it's flying through the air, only when it hits, which may be right here. Key selected, go one frame forward. Now you can see, we're kind of running into a little bit of an issue there because the rotation is starting at this point. So this might be, we might have to go in and just offset one frame, each of these. Because you see right now, although it is getting pretty good looking, let's just take this back to zero. Flying through the air. Yeah, see, I'm almost thinking we almost want to key it here at zero. Key, go to 48, squish, Go a few, you know, go one frame here and go back to zero. But that means we need to go back and take this center part and just move it down a little bit. See? Let's go ahead and alter these now. Okay, so I can actually just take these keys. Watch what it is. I'm gonna hold shift. Cut those keys and just move them back a little bit. Oops, I cut the wrong keys. Yes, I did. I meant to cut the keys for that there. Key selected. That means this next one would physically be the squash, which means the next one would be a zero, which means grabbing the center one, just nudging it down. Okay. See how it gets that bounce now? So again, what we're doing here with the squasher, I can even grab this squasher if I want to, right? Is key it, next frame, down, next frame, back to zero. tells me again, move this center one up so it's on the ground. See, and there I'm hitting and not even squishing. see just a little bit of stretch now there is you know we could without rotation if I eliminate rotation I could actually have it stretch upward too so that this very next frame watch this okay key selected go one frame forward on that top and okay, give it a direction even now, the problem with that is I did not have a key on the X movement. So you can see I can get a little more. Okay? But then I got to be careful because the next one I got to take back to zero. See? So let's see how this plays back in real time. It looks pretty good. Pretty simple. Not too difficult. So, if I know that's the performance of my light ball, it's going to be a lot easier now to do my heavy ball. And I can come to 10. And I'm probably going to get it so right about here, this ball has already come to a stop, so my other one jumps right over. So, what I'm going to do here, though, because I know what direction I need to rotate, right? That's going to be X. 
So key select the X, and I'm going to translate key selected in the Y and the X for those. So that now, remember the heavy ball is going to get there a lot quicker because it has a lot less bounce. So I could just take this right now. I'm going to drop it right there. Or maybe I'll go here. At least I can jump over top of it. And that gets me to the point now where I can pretty much just have one key that represents the rotation. So let's just say 720. So that ball there start. Start. Oh, my bad. Here I am keying the X. And it's actually the Z. Key selected. Okay, you got to watch those X, Y's, and Z's because it's different for a lot of different software machines. Again, if you're in Studio Max, for some reason, up and down is Z, whereas in Maya, up and down is Y. It's just one of those silly things. All right, so it was a Z issue, okay? And now I'm looking at this, and once again, it's rolling in the inverse direction. So let's say negative 720. give it a value right here to the end. Back a frame. Up. Over. Right. It's just this here is gonna fall fast and hard. with the rotation even. So I'll have it hit when it's flat. Like that. A little bit of distance to clear that edge. And the bounce is going to be very abrupt. Right? Bounce. Get a little bit of rotation here. Move it over just a smidge. Like that. Go in between now. And this is just going to have a little bit of bounce to it, right? Not a lot, just a little. Light, heavy. Okay. Now, when it comes to actual now capturing, right, I'll just hit save here, but when it comes time to actually doing something about this, remember, I'm perfectly fine at this point in time with you guys learning about play blasts. Come on. And I'm also fine if I want to come here and say, hey, you know what, I've got some extra. Let's unlock our layers. Go ahead and just throw on a. I'll go ahead and throw on a white little stadium for them, right? I can leave these little grids on here if I want to, especially if I were to just use them as my method of my madness. Just move them back a little bit. Now they're not going to render, 
because they're just vertices, but they will show up in the play blast, which is bad. So if we want to actually sit here and render this off as is, right, we can do a play blast or remember. We could also create a lighting scenario. Now, let me show you something right here, okay? Remember we did this with the last exercise. I'm gonna hit save a second. I'm gonna go back and I'm gonna open a recent scene. Let me see here. Uh, I know there's a recent somewhere, recent files. And I'm gonna find the catapult. Oh no, you guys didn't do the catapult, I'm sorry. Hold on one second. I'm just gonna show you though, okay, I can use the catapult, why not? Because when I showed you guys last, uh, last week is that we can create um, elements. So I could select the lights, right? So I have just the lights in the scene. It's already a three-point light system. And I'm going to group them just by hitting Control-G. And then I'm going to export the selection as, watch this. And to do this, I'll call this my lighting. Export selection. Now this is just, if you're curious what this is, this is actually a dynamic simulation class I'm doing right now. And it's pretty cool because it's all about a catapult that throws a ball and knocks over these guys. And we've got all these different things set up here. But you can see, so if you ever take a dynamic simulation, this is the kind of stuff we do is we play around with rigid bodies, particles, stuff like that. I'm gonna try to get these tutorials kind of put up there. Now again, it's kind of failing in the simulation because it wasn't saved properly. Let's go back to my recent though. Light heavy. Because right now, if I turn on my lights and I turn on my shadows, I get nothing in the software side of it at all, right? But I can import in the lighting, see this? And already have a light scenario set up here because I've already built the lights, see that? Now, one thing I'm a little upset with here, which I'll have to zoom out and find out, is, yeah, this guy needs to be moved. That's a good chance to use the T-tool because it's got a little too heavy of a shadow. Do that. This is my simple point light, which I'll move over a little bit. There we go. So you see, I got light shadow performance here. Now again, don't judge your screen. Don't judge your screen that this is what's going to render. You always have to go to the view, camera settings, and turn on your resolution or your film gate to see what actually is going to be on screen. So I could actually set this up a lot better. Like so. Turn off my grid. And maybe I'll turn on ambient occlusion, just because it's kind of nice with ambient occlusion. Also, when you do the play blast, you can go with the default play blast or go to the render settings for your play blast where you can actually choose, okay, the full 1080, HD 1080, okay? That's really all you have to do without rendering. If you're just doing a play blast, and I'm gonna focus on that today anyways, just the play blast. And now I go to Windows, Play Blast, Option Box, and do it, hey, from the time slider. I can choose the AVI, but I'm gonna remind you guys again and again. The Play Blast Lyric, great. However, the AVI is an uncompressed, no encoded, none, file, which means they're extremely large. And I don't want large, uncompressed AVI. So we're still going to have to convert your Play Blast to an H.264, and we could do that with Media Encoder, actually. It's very quick. And the difference is, uh, uh, what, 100 frames, 200 frames, whatever it happens to be that I'm working with here. That we're going to get into gigabytes of size if we are not careful with an uncompressed AVI. So one thing we want to make sure that we're doing here when we do this is that when we do the play blast, that we're doing it, it's saving it, right? 
and it should be saving because I set new project, it should automatically be saving to the movies folder. Let's let it run through, chug through, see how it looks. Well, that's bizarre. I don't know why it did that. Let's, let's try that again. Let's try going back. It's probably our render setting, something I forgot to do here. In the comments section, perspective HD. Let's change this to name extension number. We'll put the end frame to be, I did what, 100 frames total at the end here. Let's just switch this to being our target setting. Just trying to switch the Maya software here to being production quality. And again, if I wanted to render it, I could turn on ray tracing. I can turn on motion blur just to have that available. Save it. Let's try the play blast option again, where again, view, ornaments, AVI, quality, scale, frame padding, save to file, yes, and play blast. There, now it's showing me a proper play blast, right? Looks good. That gets us our AVI. And there you see the process in real time, right? All right. But again, that AVI, which I just created, which gets saved to the movies file, see there it is, is 599 megabytes. It's huge. So what are we going to do? Well, you launch your Adobe Media Encoder, okay? And all you got to do is drag it in here. An Adobe Media Encoder typically comes in with your student subscription. And just click on this one. Now, again, if you're on a Mac, this is going to say QuickTime or MOV. If you're on most PCs, it says AVI. Mine says H.264 because this is what I'm always doing. Choose the H.264. Now, the presets here, you can match the source. You can choose another 1080. Just be aware that Facebook 1080 or uh, YouTube or Vimeo 1080 will have a little bit of bitrate compression just for faster playback, you know, uh, faster streaming. If you don't know, just choose high quality 1080. Do not hit 4K. High quality 1080p. And that's going to give me the best possible version of this. And finally, your output name. This is where it's going to go. Hey, look, it's already going to go bouncing ball movies. So I could just simply Start with the word last name. Obviously, put your your last name. Light heavy ball. You could say module, you know, two. Hit save. Hit OK. But nothing's done yet until you hit this green arrow. And that green arrow means now you're going to convert that, what was it? 500, 600 megabyte file. Look how quick it is now converting it to an H.264. And so it was, as an uncompressed AVI, 600 megabytes. The H.264 MPEG-4 is only 1.33 megabytes. Now again, you can do that in After Effects, you can do that in Premiere, and look, it looks perfectly fine in its quality. If you're gonna do this and you want to render it, You would need to use After Effects to put the render together. Or if you, hey, if you've got all the time in the world, right? Remember, to render, all we need to do is go here, render ring, render, batch render, and it's a render because I've already set my settings. I've got set it to software render, not Arnold. You want to pursue Arnold? There's a hundred different tutorials I basically show. When you use Arnold, though, you have to use Arnold shaders. You have to use Arnold lighting. It's, it's basically taken over the old render engine called Mental Ray, or V-Ray is now called Arnold. And it's Maya's proprietary kind of rendering engine. Uh, Max uses it as well. Uh, it's kind of just been built off of you know, RenderMan and some of these other rendering software. And you see the progress down below. It's actually rendering. You want to know what it looks like? You can go and you can view the sequence. It knows exactly where it's located, and you can see what this is looking like in the render view. See? And again, it's only done a few frames right now, so...
that will take a while to render. So I'm actually going to go back to my render and cancel batch render. I'm not gonna render it this time. I'm just gonna go with the play blast. Hey, that play blast is fine. Make sure you take that, upload that to the uh, designated uh, module, right? Right here in the assignment, or like I said, you can put it into the discussion form where other people can see it and put discussions to it. So that's about it I have for today, guys. That's all I've got to you. Uh, enjoy the tutorial, good luck with it. Like I said, we'll be working on this for a few weeks and looking forward to seeing your submissions for not only this project, but the pre previous prior module one as well. Take care.